Okay, you are good to go. <laughs> okay, thank you. So tonight we're going to talk about um, the process we used for building the beds. And um, I'd like to open the presentation with just a short little um, history of how we got where we are. Um, a couple of years ago, I had to do a large photocopying project and I went to the library to do it. And it took, I don't know, half an hour. So even I were sitting down just, you know, chit chatting and the seed library had just started at the library. And she was mentioning some of the other things that um, other libraries were doing. And she just talked about the raised beds. And I thought, oh, that'd be a cool thing to do with the Egg Society. So, I had to then take my large photocopying um, to the post office to send them out in the mail. And as I was driving there, I phoned Juliet and I said, you know, we had this cool idea, da, 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 da. And Juliet goes, I know about some funding that's out there. Let's see if we can do it and get it funded. So to make a long story short, we put in the funding um, and got a grant from the government um, in their grassroots program. And the program is just winding up now. We're in the last uh, two months of it. Um, so everything that um, we've been doing for the last two years has been based on the funding and the efforts from um, the Dunchurch Agriculture Society and the Whitestone Library and Technology Center. So I just think it's an excellent example of a partnership. And I'm going to be doing a presentation at the um, Ontario Agricultural Society's convention um, talking about partnering in small communities. And this is one of the um, projects that I'm gonna use as a highlight to show how partnership can really help in your community. So again, as Eva said, if you have any questions as I'm going through this, by all means, pipe up. Um, you can either put your hand up or unmute and ask your question. And I do have a space at the end of the presentation as well. So the first thing we did was, um, Juliet did most of this. Um, we figured out a design. So this is something that you can be doing um, over the winter, thinking about, dreaming about what you'd like to do. Um, part of the reason why you want to do a design for what you're going to do is it will help you figure out what space you need, where it needs to be situated, and then what your hardware requirements are. How much lumber are you going to need? How much stain? What are, you know? What are your materials that you're going to use to build it? So this is one of the designs that we did. This is the design for the medicine garden um, that's in the front of the library under the sign. And then we had other other designs for the square boxes and for the uh, long thin ones that we used for the climbers. So these are the materials and tools that we used during our build. We had are built. We um, purchased lumber and corner kits, and we'll talk about each of these in some detail. Uh, we purchased wire for our climbers. Um, the tools we required was a skill saw, cordless drill, a level, a mallet or a hammer, string, and my uh, screen is blocked here, uh, string and stakes. Um, we used a small bucket tractor, but you can also use a wheelbarrow. We did use a wheelbarrow as well, actually. Um, you'll need rake, shovels, measuring tape, and then if you're going to do the, who, who, I don't know if I say this right, hugo culture, um, we use cardboard branches and leaves, and then mulch and topsoil, and then once we had them built, um, we used a combination of seeds and started plants, ones that were started um, and then transplanted. And then you're going to want some kind of water storage, watering cans, composters, things like that as well to complement the garden. So the first thing that we looked at purchasing was our lumber. Um, your lumber can be bought and prepared prior to your actual build. So that was what we did. We did that in the early spring. We acquired our cedar lumber. We bought um, six inch uh, by one inch by eight feet boards. And the reason we chose the eight foot boards is that was our longest length we needed was eight feet. Our square uh, gardens were four feet. And then um, the medicine garden had some um, parts that were just under two feet. So this made the most sense for us. We got very little waste out of it when we cut it. Um, so that was also part of our calculations was how much did we need and how to cut it so that we, we um, got the best use out of it. 
We treated it with a sealer. So we chose a food grade sealant. So, and made sure that if um, it was against the, if we didn't have enough of that, we had some challenges with getting enough of it in time. So we always made sure that that was what was up against the soil. And this is again, something that can be done um, in the spring, as long as you've got some sunshine and a warm place to do this, you can do this leading up to your actual build before you're ready to plant. So we had all of our lumber sealed. I think we were doing that in April, if I remember correctly. Um, so, and this was available at our local hardware stores. Uh, they ordered it in for us. Then um, we had made the decision as part of our construction to use aluminum corner kits. And uh, in this picture, it shows various different configurations that you can do. And we actually didn't use any of these configurations. We did use a square box, but we used um, the two foot poles to do it with. So we use these poles to make a square box. And then we use these poles to actually make something that looks like this, a rectangle. But you have lots of options and what what how these work is the wood it's there's a one inch extrusion or or a bracket or whatever you want to call it in here and your wood slides right into there and then you screw through so that's what holds it together so on the inside you'll see in a further slide we'll be um, screwing this together but you can choose to do raised beds um, if you like with buying those options as well. And you can, again, the configuration of it, whether you do a rectangle or a square is up to you. And you'll see that we did a fancy design with our medicine garden, um, just based on how we oriented those corner units. Um, there's something that you can buy again from local suppliers. We got these in out of Perry Sound. Um, they're very quick and easy. Uh, the other option is you could use lumber for your corners, but then that means securing all of the boards to the lumber and um, a lot more cuts. So we thought, we thought this was much more economical and um, easy assembly. So the next step for us is once the um, frost was out of the ground and we were starting to get some warmth, we started to prepare our space. So uh, Juliet scraped away all of the grass and the roots from, from this space that we were working in. And then uh, we put down a weed control so that if there was any remaining roots or seeds or anything under there, they would um, hopefully not come up through. We purchased in a, uh, you can see behind the tractor, a truckload of mulch. And so we had a gentleman in town who was kind enough to bring his little, um, tractor with a bucket and he located a lot of the mulch for us so that we could then spread it. So we spread the mulch layer as a foundation for our raised beds. Next, we started to prepare the space. So you see Juliet, myself and uh, Jane raking this into a uh, probably about an inch to two inch layer. Um, this just helped us get it flat and even, and um, the mulch that's under these beds will provide nutrients in, into the future as well. And here's our space all prepared. So this was, this was a couple of hours activity one day. We broke it down into multiple days so that uh, it wasn't an onerous task to do it all at one time. So this was um, one, one work day getting the, the space prepared. Our next work day was um, doing the assembly. So the first thing, um, this is all the lumber arriving at the at our work site, and um, it you know it needs to have been dried from the sealant, and then you can cut it to the appropriate sizes. So here we have Joe McEwen came and assisted us this day, and he cut um, a lot of the lumber for us to get it ready. Then the next step was to mark out our spacing. So we used um, strings and stakes. So we went back to our original design. We pulled out our paperwork and figured out what size we needed, where we wanted to locate it exactly on, on top of the mulch. And it's hard to see, but there's a string running right down where my um, cursor is going up and down. And Jane is working with the, these are, this is the kit, the corner kit. So she's pulling out the corner kits and reading the instructions. 
and um, Beth is make, is uh, making sure that my drill is charged, I guess. And this is all of the uh, helpers on that day starting the actual build. So you take the, the piece of aluminum, you can see it here down on the ground where my cursor is moving at uh, Beth's feet and you insert the board. So in this case, we were able to, we had four boards and we just used a hammer to make sure that we got them all the way in. Also down at Beth's feet is the other piece. Um, when you put this piece on, you put it on here at the top. And when we did this, we took a piece of scrap wood and used it to do the banging so that when we were hammering or malleting the um, aluminum down, we weren't damaging it with marks from our hammer but when you're just working on the wood, we didn't bother. So what you end up with is we did, we did two sides with both legs on it, and then we laid them down and put the um, other sides in them and then flipped them up. So it's quite an easy build. And then here's a picture of me doing the, um, the final step with screwing doing the screw work. So um, these all come with the kit, the screws that you use there, they were a, a bolt type head with a screw and they just go in and hold the wood in place. We didn't put one in all four boards. We just put one in the top and the bottom. And then the kit also comes with a cover that goes over so that there's no raw edges of metal. There's a plastic cover that goes over the top of these. So here we are, um, we wanted our um, layout to be 100% wheelchair accessible. This is right beside the parking lot at the library if any of you haven't seen our beds. Um, so a person in a wheelchair would be able to um, get out of their vehicle in the parking lot and wheel right over to our beds and be able to maneuver all through them. So this is Juliet and I ensuring that we have the right proportion so that all of the beds are accessible. And again, we were referring back to our original plan. And then the other thing you wanna do when you're doing these is make sure you take a break. Um, this was on our second day, we were halfway through our build. So we had a visitor come by and Jane had provided us with some cookies and we brought drinks. So always make sure you, you look after taking a, a, a little rest when you're doing these. So once we started filling the beds, um, the first thing we did was put down cardboard. So a bunch of us saved up cardboard. Um, we tried to remove the tape or anything like that that um, wouldn't, wasn't biodegradable. And then we uh, broke the cardboard down until it was flat and filled the space entirely so that it covered over top of the mulch that the, that the um, raised beds are sitting on top of. And then we started filling in with leaves, twigs, branches, whatever we could find that was a biodegradable product. All of this is, was free, didn't cost us anything. And we'll provide um, good drainage for the beds and also provide um, future nutrients as this breaks down. So this is a bed that has had um, a layer of branches put on top of the leaves. So we filled them, you can see we had it, we were a four board system. So you can see that we filled to approximately halfway with our cardboard and our um, natural product, our natural um, product that will deteriorate. And then we had some helpers come and we put in uh, a layer of mulch on top. So this fills in all the gaps um, and they came in, kind of reminds me of making wine, but they got into the beds for us and dumped them all down and made sure we had a nice compressed bed ready to go to put our topsoil in. And this is the bed at the, uh, this is the medicine garden at the front under the sign. Um, also prepared and ready to go. Then the final layer is the topsoil. We ordered in um, a load of triple mix. Um, we found it was a little, not quite as triple as we'd hoped, but um, we uh, 
got a good deal on this in the community. So um, it was uh, appreciated. And, and this is what we used for our very final layer. And here is one of our square beds pulled. So we didn't fill them right to the top. Um, we put in about six, six inches or so of um, soil. And again, this can be done with with either a tractor bucket or uh, I think we were using a wheelbarrow at this point where we just picked up the wheelbarrow and dumped it over into the beds. So here we built six beds um, beside the parking lot. Uh, there are essentially our tomato and lettuce and peppers and various other vegetables in them. This is our um, configuration that we used for the climbing plants. So we built long thin boxes and these are situated up against the back of the library. We put a support system in um, since we had quite a high back on them. And then this is a uh, near eight foot by four foot screening. So you can see in this next picture that the, the peas, these are peas, uh, yeah, uh, we're able to climb up this wire at, during their growth. And again, this was all filled. This was the picture here is after it had just been finished construction, but this again was filled with a layer of mulch and then a layer of, of dirt. And this is the medicine garden as it was in process of being planted. Um, this garden is very is oriented towards um, First Nations culture. We have used a lot of the concepts of their four the four um, important things the, the the four directions are being represented here. We have the four um, sacred plants that they have. So we have a cedar. Um, we have sweet grass. I believe this end has the white sage and this end has the tobacco. And then in various other places, we have other medicinal plants that um, we can grow in Ontario to provide us with an example of medicinal plants. So some of the other things that we, we did as part of our build is um, we decided that we wanted to have greenhouses um, on a couple of the raised beds so that we could start plants in them early in the spring when there was still a possibility of frost at night. So this is hardware that you hang on the corners of, of your um, raised bed. And you'll see we haven't, I don't, I hadn't screwed it in yet. I think I just was placing it. And then we put the cover back on once we had it in there. And then um, these are systems that you buy with these arches and they go down. So you can see they go down into that hardware. And then there's a cover that you purchase that you can roll back. So probably this back side we would leave covered, but the front side we would probably undo and allow the sun to come in. And then in the evening they can cover it back up again. So the idea, is, it's a very inexpensive method for having a greenhouse to get some of your plants started in the earlier parts of spring. Since we have such late frost, it will really benefit our garden. And then some of the other accessories we did, um, we acquired a composter and we acquired two water tanks. Um, and Unfortunately, I didn't get a picture of it finished, but what we did is we took one water tank and put it here below the spout. And then we have a second water tank that sits here. So this was a custom built box again by um, local residents who assisted us. And we then purchased a hose system that you can see on the, on the water tank that there is a connector availability. So what we did was we ran a little hose that goes between the two the two water tanks. So the water comes into the first tank, when it fills, it overflows into the second tank. And then if the second tank overflows, it has a hose that runs out of it and just drains away from the building. Um, 
but and then at the bottom of these, um, there's a spigot. So um, because these are now raised, you're not having to bend over to the ground. There's the spigot hole. The spigot's not been installed yet, but you don't have to bend over. Um, the spigot's at quite a nice height to put your watering can under it and um, fill it up. So here's some examples of the bounty that we um, had with um, as a result of doing our garden. We felt we got it in, you know, just in time, if not a little late. But we did. Um, we got some peas out of here. You can see some quite healthy peas growing in here. We had uh, some lovely tomato plants. We did add tomato cages, so we got some quite nice, healthy tomato plants. And we had lettuce and I believe peppers. And Juliet, do you remember? Was there anything else? Those are the ones I remember. Oh, well, we brought in Brussels sprouts and um, kohlrabi. Yes, kohlrabi. That was a good one. And cucumber. Okay. We had a lot of cucumbers grow this summer, a lot of peppers, a lot of tomatoes, um, and so many beans. Like too, too many too many beans yeah <laughs> too, like we were we could not give away the beans at the end of the year we planted way too many beans <laughs> but we saved the seeds for them right we saved <laughs> we saved I think a few of them we had a lot of bean plants uh seeds which is why we saved we had planted so many and we did save quite a few of them as well great so um this is part of uh you know, the partnership with um, the Dunchurch Ag Society. We took the leadership on building the beds and then the library and the technology center um, looked after the maintenance and the, of the gardens and the harvest. So it was a great partnership in um, putting together this program. Uh, a lot of the kids, these are actual grandkids of um, Sheila, I believe, um, but Sheila is both a, a member of the library and a member of the Ag Society, so she crossed purpose, but it was nice to see the um, kids that volunteer at the library helping to maintain the gardens this year. So it was a good learning opportunity for youth to uh, be able to come out here and understand how a uh, vegetable garden works and have those skills for in the future if they ever chose to, to grow their own food. So the other thing that came out of us doing the um, raised beds was um, produce sharing. Um, Eva, you gave away a lot of vegetables, I'm assuming, this summer and many, fall. <laughs> many, many, many all through the summer and the fall, up until frost. So here's some of the, I think you said this was a picture of your last, your last pick. Tomato, cucumber, beans. It was and this and um, an entire bushel basket of tomatoes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So this got us talking about the fact that we had all this produce and we were saying, I bet other people have produce in the community that they don't know what to do with. So one of the things that we decided to do was put bushel baskets on the veranda at the library. And it was a take what you want, leave what you want system. Um, so you can see this is probably a little later in the season where all the pumpkins and the squash and probably zucchini, I don't know, whatever's in there, um, were being left at the library because we didn't grow any of those kinds of things um, for people to share and, and utilize. So I'd love to see more of this next um, summer, whereas, um, you know, if someone has a bounty of early tomatoes or something like that, they can just leave them at the library and know that it's going to go to a, a someone else in the community. So um, I'm currently down in Florida and uh, the resort that I'm staying at has a raised bed garden as well. So this is a picture of um, how they did the raised beds. They, um, these beds are on legs. So behind this insulation is nothing. There's just the legs. Um, their beds actually get air underneath them and Floridians think it gets cold here, um, which of course it doesn't, but they've 
put all these insulation boards around them now so that the cold air can't come up under their beds and um, make them colder. And what they've done is put this a similar system in, but they're using just PVC pipe that they've attached to the side of the beds here. And then they just throw blankets or sheets or whatever they have over top of this. So we do get a couple of nights a year where it goes below freezing and there is frost on the ground. So they just cover these so that um, the lettuce and uh, or tomatoes don't get damaged. And then over here is another example of how to do climbers. So they've put a, a done a frame as well and um, put some wire and or, and or string, I think it's wire here so that their uh, beans have a place to be supported. And then the other fun thing that they've done down here is they've created a bucket ladder. So this is a system where you have buckets, um, a graduated system for, um, and then each of these buckets will have a different thing growing in it. So it looks like there's some onions or chives and I'm not sure what some of this other stuff is. I didn't really go look. The one thing I haven't figured out is, and I keep forgetting to ask, see how they have all these empty water bottles? I don't quite know what they're there for, but they're always there. So I don't think, I don't know if they use them for watering or if they're there to absorb the frost or I, I, I don't know. I have to ask why they're there, but they're always our bottles and there's bottles in these next ones as well. I, there's some bottles around, so I don't, I don't quite know why they do that. I'll have to ask the gardening club why they do that. Okay, so that's my presentation as far as how we did it and what we did and why we made some of the choices that we made. So I'd like to open it up to any questions from our audience. or comments Hello. from our other team members. Hi, can you hear me? Sure. Hi, it's Jennifer. Um, I'm just wondering how the deer don't come out, come and eat everything or how I, there's moles in my backyard and mice. Um, do they not eat the things? We had, there was no deer that came in. Um, we had something large knock over the compost a couple of times before we had enough in it to kind of um, keep it upright. Um, we had some of the, some of the peas were eaten by squirrels and mice, but um, only if we left them like over a couple of days, we were picking them really regularly when they first started coming up, but we never had any problems with deer. Okay. And where should this be placed, like full sun, partial sun? So in, in our situation, we had some beds that were full sun and some beds that are partial sun. And that was partially because that was the only space we had, but that allowed us to mix and match what you put in your garden. So it depends on what you're trying to grow. Um, as to where you situate them. And the nice thing is if, if you take the dirt out, these are movable. So if you find that you can't, you know, they aren't working where they are, you can empty them, move them, and then refill them. Okay, thank you. To add to that, like the, um, the beds with the peas and the beans and the climbing things, they were in the partial sun along the side of the building. So they got a little bit of sun at the end of the day. Um, and then one of the garden beds that was situated a little bit closer to the trees, Juliet opted to plant um, the lettuces in that spot. And I think there was Brussels sprouts in there as well. And it was a little bit shadier and a little bit cooler because a few of the other garden beds got full day mm -hmm. sun. So the, the tomatoes did really well in, in those spots. The nice thing about the raised beds for anyone who's becoming um, older, <laughs> it's much easier on your back. Once they're built, they're much easier for you to tend to. And the other thing that we purchased, I didn't put, I should have put in the presentation, is what we call kneelers. Um, 
and they are um, they're a U-shaped device that you that have foam um, in the middle. And if you have them shaped like a U, if you kneel on them, your knees are, are on the foam. But if you flip it around, it becomes a seat. Um, and then you can sit on it and do your gardening. Now, if you're someone who really wants to spend your entire time sitting on your raised bed, then I would recommend that you're doing more of a four by four construction. Um, at my prior home, we did um, four by four construction of a raised flower bed and you could literally sit on it and do your gardening. Um, I wouldn't wanna sit on these this style because it's just not made for supporting that kind of weight on the edges. But um, that those are some of the things that you need to consider is what kind of access do you want and what kind of support do you need? Um, and how, how will you garden with it as to which style you build? Uh, Carol wanted me to speak to the seed library and how um, the possibilities for everybody to use it. So the seed library at the library was started by the Agricultural Society. So it's we took it down for a couple months just to, so we have room for the snowshoes, but we'll be putting it up in February again in time for starting seeds inside. Uh, you are welcome to come and take seeds from the seed library. And a lot of what was planted in the gardens at the library were seeds from the seed library. Uh, some of them were started inside in a plant ladder, also supplied through this grant by the Ag Society with a lighting system. And the way the seed library works is you can take seeds out and we just record what you've taken. So it helps us keep track of what are the popular seeds and how many people are using the seed library. And then you can either donate commercial seeds back after you're done planting. Say you only used a quarter of a packet of seeds. You can donate the rest of the seeds back to the library. Uh, you can also save seeds from produce that you grow at home and donate them back into the library. If you do that, we do ask that they're very, they're very, very dry and labeled as well, what they are as close as you can get. So whatever the breed is, that kind of thing, and the year and date that you picked them. What's been the most popular, Eva? What has been the most popular? Uh, I think the flower ones go out as soon as we get them in, but they're probably not the most popular. I'd have to take the, I'd have to check the spreadsheet. Give me one moment. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. We've had, I think over 500 varieties of seeds over the two wow. years. Like the, it's not even been two years. Uh, let's see. Seed catalog, okay. And we do only accept donations of seeds that are less than four years old as well. Um, we try to keep them within within two years or three years, but we do accept up to four years. Let's see. So we've had 204 packets go out this year of seeds. Um, let's see here. And then we've got a spreadsheet that we keep track of notes about how to sow and uh, days to harvest, that kind of thing, whether or not they're heirloom or organic. Uh, looks like beans have been really popular. Tomatoes have been really popular. Really everything. We're out of a lot of peas. So if anybody wants to donate peas, <laughs> that would be great. And we will need probably a refresh on some of the tomatoes again this year as well. Um, we've had a lot of incoming seeds this year, which is exciting, um, like bok choy and mustard seeds, that kind of thing. Uh, peppers are another one that you, we can't keep on the shelf for very long. So really if, oh, basil, any herbs to go really quickly, actually. Yes, uh, Julia, do you want to speak to that? So while we're all encouraged to uh, harvest seeds out of our vegetables that we've grown, um, I learned quite quickly that it's not a good idea to grow summer squash like a zucchini in the same area where you're growing a nice autumn squash. Um, I had spaghetti squash growing, for instance, and I had a cross-pollination happen quite by accident. 
And um, the fruit was not summer squash and it wasn't <laughs> spaghetti squash. So it was edible, just not very tasty. <laughs> so we don't want um, a, an accident like that to happen and then become a new vegetable in the library uh, seed bank because it's nice for us all to go in there and know what we're going to get when we pick up what it says on the package. <laughs> Which is also when it comes to planting, if you're going to plant multiple varieties of tomatoes and save the seeds for them as well, you're also going to be watch out for that kind of thing because if it's a hybrid, for example, the it, it would no longer be a hybrid or a new hybrid, which we'd also want to avoid if possible. <laughs> yes. And then one of the other things we I didn't uh, think about putting in the presentation is maintenance. So as our um, soil sinks because of the materials that we put below it, we will have to augment the, um, the soil levels periodically. Meaning? We have to add Adding more. Soil, add more <laughs> oh, soil, oh. yes, we'll have to add more <laughs> soil. Which there, that would be something that you will need to think about in the spring is, you know, before you start doing your planting, have a good look at your garden, see how it wintered. Did you, you know, did your, did you have um, subsidence? Um, do you need to supplement it? Do you know, do you need to put in, change your mix up a bit? Do you need to add some loam or add some, you know, topsoil, whatever? Um, so part of what you want to do in the spring is evaluate your your bed and determine whether or not it needs any maintenance before you get into your planting season. And you can pick up um, soil testing kits at, I think, hardware stores as well, if you want to know the details of your soil. Mm -hmm. Or get one of the kids from the school to come over and test. There you go. I like that too. Invite the school to check your garden out as part of their project. Any other questions? Another question from Jennifer. If you wanted to do a small little garden out of the buckets, obviously you just do some drainage holes. Do you still do the cardboard process and do some layers or? I personally would. Juliet, what would you recommend? Stones, would you use stones? Um, there's two schools on the stones. Um, I know when I worked at Richter's, they filled all the bottom of the pots with um, broken pot shards uh, to provide ample drainage, but it ended up causing more problems than it solved, uh, just because the pot was designed to do a job and then they changed the design. But um, for hugel culture, I don't think I would put it in such a small application because the first little bit the, the wood is actually leaching from the soil some of the nutrients because it also needs those nutrients to begin its breakdown process. But the good news is once it's done its leak, um, once it has started breaking down, it provides food in reciprocation. So um, if you wanted to put a bit of um, charcoal, if you had charcoal, clean charcoal out of your own fireplace, you could. Um, soak that for a bit and, and um, wash it down and then put that in the bottom of your uh, soil mix because it will provide aeration and it will also provide nutrient eventually. Okay, so just a bottom layer, layer of that and then soil, that's it? And then holes in the bottom of the bucket? Yes. And if you're worried about um, evaporation on the top, you can put things in like um, vermiculite on the top that keeps holds the moisture in. And it protects the uh, the root stems a little bit from the damping off that can happen. That's not a, you, a fun thing to have happen. Or just replace, you, I guess just replace it so it's kind of fresh every once in a while too, because it's not a lot. It's just a bucket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and couldn't fresh. you top dress it with with mulch as well, Juliet, to to help with the water drying out? Absolutely. It depends on how hardy. Your plant is though, if you're using the buckets as opposed to our, our larger garden space, um, it, a tomato might grow a thick enough stalk to handle that. But I'm, I was thinking about uh, seedlings, getting seedlings started and I wouldn't have mulch in there with the seedlings right away. No, no. Um, I would have a vermiculite. Right. 
But once you get into the hot, in, when you're into the July timeframe and the, the sunburn could just burn off all your fluid in the day, you could mulch it then. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, I would have mulch over it then. Or at least give it some shade. If you're in, in pails that can be moved, you can move your garden to shade when it needs it. Okay, so what does mulch do again? <laughs> it dry. Well, that'll keep your moisture in. Moisture, so if okay. you yeah, if you've watered it and the dirt is exposed to the air or the soil, sorry, is oh, exposed it. to okay. the air, it will dry out. You'll see it happen. But if you put the mulch on and holds it in just a little bit better and keeps it a bit cooler. It also it, helps with weed control that it um, deters other seeds once you start seedlings. I know in our flower gardens, we do it. My husband's a flower gardener and he mulches um for weed control because once he's got the plant established and he mulches around it then he doesn't get as much weeds trying to start in in because they can't start in the mulch okay thank seed. you um mary has a question about uh rotating crops in raised garden beds like you would on a regular garden she wants to know if we would be doing that I pay did. attention to tomatoes and beans. Beans are a nitrogen fixing plant, so they're good for everybody. Uh, but tomatoes and corn um, and um, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, any of the brassicas, they're big feeders. So you wanna put them somewhere else. Also, if you rotate, you can fight the bugs better too. We like to keep those bugs on their toes. And that's the that's the beauty of having multiple beds. You can turn, you know, especially if they all have similar circumstances as to how much they're exposed to wind and sun, then um, you can rotate around what you grow in each of them from year to year. And don't forget, we're not experts. We're still learning. So <laughs> if we've put something in a wrong spot, we can try a different spot next year and find out that it's ever so much happier there. <laughs> And we're going to label better this year too. <laughs> so, so when they all come up, we're going to know what they are instead of having to wait for them to fruit. Get the cricket making some labels. That's it. I think, well, we 3D printed some of them because we got the 3D printer partway through this project as well. So we had, we started 3D printing them. Um, but then we had, to, anyway, there was there was some things that we planted a whole lot of like carrots that uh, we maybe planted too many um, and radishes and honestly it's amazing the amount of stuff that was planted in those garden beds. Uh, Carol wants to know what we used for fertilizer beyond the eggshells that we put on the tomato plant. I think Jane came in and put fertilizer in on uh, one day, a little bit of fertilizer in the beds. Yes, I did, Eva. I brought in some, I believe it was a triple 19 mix that we would use here on the farm. And I sprinkled a bit on each of the beds. Didn't want to overdo it because um, it can burn the plants. So it can be tried again, but it was a commercial fertilizer. And then in the future, we'll have compost as well, um, but it'll be a little bit yet before we actually have any compost from the compost bin. But if you guys have uh, veggie scraps, feel free to bring them to the library and dump them into that compost bin come spring. Um, something else you might wanna try if you don't wanna put the money out on mulch, uh, if you're cutting your lawn and it got ahead of you and you've got quite a bit of uh, grass clippings that you need to get rid of, they're excellent to put down around your plants because it's a plant itself and um, it will keep the moisture in and it will protect the roots and it will also decompose and become fertilizer for you.
Okay, so any other questions? I might have a, a comment, Carol, with regards to your gardens down in Florida and the water bottles being all over the place. I noticed one or two that were upside down. And I do know um, people will use a water bottle in that capacity because it would slow feed into the, the garden. So you could put a big jug there and fill it right up, have a trickle feed into the plant or right near the plant root so that you're not going to be getting the plant wet, but just watering the soil around it so that the roots get the benefit. Oh, so you think there might be holes punched in the bottom of those jugs? Quite possibly. And or a uh, hose that's inside that is stuck down into the soil so it waters deep. Okay. And then they just have to open up the top, put the hose in to fill it and, okay. Yeah, I keep I always keep forgetting to ask what they're for because they've been there for the last couple of years, so. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. If there's no further questions, um, be interesting to see if anybody does build any garden beds um, to send your pictures into the library and let us know how they did. Show us some of your bounty. Um, I'm sure Eva would love to post some pictures on the website or on, on Facebook of uh, success stories as a result of doing this with the library. Definitely. And any pictures of what people grow from their from the seeds from the seed library are great as well. Have a great night, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording in a second. Sorry, Delilah's just here uh, talking about her pretend dog needing a Band-Aid. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. sorry. <laughs>